Música Good day and welcome to Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I am your host, Jacques Hingson Compton, and today we're talking SSDF. And right now we're here with the Executive Director of the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, or SSDF, Dr. Alison Mathre. Dr. Mathre, how are you doing? Good morning, good morning. Very well, thank you. How about you? I'm not too bad. Thank you for coming on our program. We have a, a lot to discuss about SSDF, its various programs, its purpose. Um, first of all, I want you to start off with what exactly is SSDF's mandate and tell us a little bit about the history of SSDF. Well, uh, very simply, the mandate is poverty alleviation. Um, the SSDF was born out of a merger between the Poverty Reduction Fund, which was started in 1997, and the Basic Needs Trust Fund, the NTF, which was started in 1979. And these two agencies merged to form the SSDF. Um, of course, the BNTF program did targets communities, poor communities, and yes, the poverty reduction fund targeted individuals, poor and indigenous, um, indigent individuals. Now, does your work mean that you work very closely with the, the Ministry of Equity? Well, um, the SSDF actually falls, it's a statutory organization, but falls under the Minister of Equity, if you will. So by extension, it is under the umbrella of the, of the Ministry of Equity. Now, you, you've mentioned um, that it's, well, one of its main purposes is poverty alleviation. Mm -hmm. um, from your view, what are some of the societal ills that result or, or come about as a result of poverty? Oh, there's the numerous, numerous um, key issues of housing, um, education, also, a lot, of, a lot of the social ills can be tied back to poverty. Um, the family structure, all of these things are affected, impacted seriously by, by, um, by, by poverty. As a matter of fact, some of the programs like the All Boys Matter program that you mentioned um, was born out of the, the, the need to try to assist um, some children in schools. So, I mean, if we, if we really want to look at it, a lot of the the killings and criminality and all of these things, but most of these things are born out of um, inadequate access or lack of access to resources that um, the children that are key in terms of getting children developed for for the world of, of life and work. So um, the business of, of dealing with poverty is, is very, very serious. Mm, now, uh, you mentioned the Our Boys Matter program. Obviously, on a as we discussed uh, off camera on another mm -hmm. program, um, I want to talk in depth mm -hmm. about it, but just give, give us a brief overview of what the Our Boys Matter program is, who it targets. Well, I, let me, let me what, I, what I will do is instead I'll tell you, because you know, when I talk about OBM, I have to talk about its both how it was born. Um, Our Boys Matter program was created um, out of a new SSDF drive, resource mobilization drive. What happened was that we haven't recognized that um, funding over the years from central government as well as from the international donors was decreasing tremendously. We recognized the need to, to tap into the private sector because the reality is that um, there are many private organizations that take their corporate responsibility very seriously. And I think government, governmental agencies haven't really tapped into it and perhaps there was no need because um, in the early days of SSDF, I mean, we used to get a lot of substantial funding, so necessity is the mother of invention. So <laughs> once that started to dry up, we needed to, 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 to um, start to see where else we could get funding to execute our mandate because um, the dwindling funds didn't decrease the number of persons needing assistance, as you'd appreciate. So 
one of the early persons, we created a resource mobilization office, brought in a new uh, uh, a resource mobilization officer, at the time was Ms. Anya Edwin, and um, one, of the, one of the early organizations we target, we went to was Massey Stores. And um, we were given, they indicated that they would be interested in partnering with DSSDF on an initiative, but two things that they required was one, it had to target vulnerable young males, and the other thing is that it had to have a mentorship component. So we went back to the drawing board, Mr. Edwin and myself, and I mean, within a day, we had developed this Our Boys Matter program that was designed, at, in the early days, we called it um, Boys to Men, and after the name that was used in Trinidad by the Massey Stores head office. And, um, but we subsequently changed it to Our Boys Matter, and basically the program seeks to we recognize that there were a number of young males in secondary schools, languishing in secondary schools, who were not, they were not equipped with the you know, theoretical knowledge and skills. They didn't have the interest, I, I should say, in that sort of thing. And they were more interested in technical, vocational, you know, types of subjects. Um, equally, you'd find that some children are interested in sports, some of them might be interested in the arts and what have you. And, but our education system doesn't really make enough allowance for that. And um, it's, it's, it's a shame that we didn't continue from schools like the Castries Comprehensive and Leon Hess and, and have, so that we could have more um, technical vocational type school training for, for young people. So we found there were a number of children sitting in schools that first of all had no interest in the academics. They were failing at every subject the attendance was poor because one of the reasons for the poor attendance was that um, the, the parents couldn't afford to pay transportation fees for them. They couldn't pay for their um, meals and what have you, so it's easier for them to keep them home. Um, what happens when, especially, especially when you have young boys in poor inner cities, what happens when they're not at school? What are they into? And chances are it's not anything good. So. Effectively, what is happening is that the, the system is, is creating a breeding ground for what we're dealing with today, with all the crime and murders and what have you. Had these boys been engaged, given a chance, a first chance, I call it. We call these second chances, you know, K and, and SDC, and we call them second chances. I call them first chance because they never got a first chance. All children, all children from very early, we need to identify what the areas of interest is and what is the aptitude and so we can channel them in the right direction otherwise it is an unfair playing field because those who are interested in the academics obviously that's the environment that we're sending everybody into but those that have other interests and the other thing we do is we make the mistake of thinking because a person may not be interested in the academics or because they may not do well in the academics that they are slow so we stigmatize people as this. But in more developed countries, there's a very high premium pay on, um, to, on technical skills, very high. And so we marginalize technical skills, we marginalize schools like care, and you know, and the thing is for children to go into, you know, everybody wants their children to be lawyers and doctors and what have you, you know, but um, perhaps there are enough people that recognize and understand that technical skills are real skills because if you take a child that's purely academic you put them in a in a technical environment they'll be slow <laughs> you understand but we look at slow in terms of the other way and so now what so what OBM sought to do is to try to address some of these issues and we believe that if we if we if we were able to bring to bear or make available to poor children even the average the average resources that that you know a normal child in secondary school have access to then we believe that it would have made a difference and we still believe that today um, the reality is when children are not we cannot say that we're providing uh, um, 
equitable access for our students when some of them can go into areas that they can excel in and others can't. So um, with that, we, our very first cohort for OBM was 100 boys. Um, we targeted 100 boys from seven secondary schools in the north. And um, it was essentially a pilot program. And for me personally, I, I never saw the OBM program. I always knew it was going to be successful because it logically just was. And, um, but I never envisaged OBM being something that sustainably the SSDF could run for a long period of time. For me, the goal, the vision has always been for the Ministry of Education to adopt the concept and for us to try to, as a country, to try to make available to all, all, all children at school the basic needs, um, meals, transportation, uniforms, books, and what have you. Once we make this equal, now there are other issues that go on in poor households, and there are, sometimes the similar issues go on in, in, in more affluent households. The difference is that the more affluent households are better able to deal with it because they have the resources to try to you know, help the children that isn't obtained in the poor households. So we thought that if we, if we brought these resources to bear, um, what we found was immediately, um, within the first year of the program, within the first few months, the attendance rate had shot up tremendously because now one of the reasons that children were staying home is because they didn't have access to meals and what have you, that had changed. Once children are interested and they have the resources to go to school, then of course you, the other thing that comes up would be their grades and we saw that. Um, so it, the good thing about it is when in the initial, initial cohort with 100, about 40 of them went to K. And I must say I'm very thankful that the Ministry of Education from the very beginning through its support 100% behind this program. As a matter of fact, one of the first meetings we had of the Ministry of Education, the ministry was represented by Mr. Sipal. And um, he's very passionate about technical, vocational, that sort of stuff. And he, he told us very early on that he would be the voice for that program. And the ministry did buy into it. And up to now, we still have the total support. We were a little bit afraid that the ministry would be reluctant to transfer children from the traditional secondary schools to okay. K. But that didn't happen. They were very supportive. And so a number of children got the opportunity to, to go to K. But I want to make the point that um, the, the OBM is not about transferring children to K. OBM is about trying to help children. If some of them have um, interest in the arts and music, then we want to help them in these areas. You know, we, we want to help children in the areas of their interest. And for perhaps for the ministry, I'm hoping that there'll be a, a, a quantitative study done, empirical data, to show, demonstrate that, it, uh, that, that, that process is successful. Um, so that basically is, but I want to say this too, um, concerning OBM, there are things that also that make this a very good program. One is there's a steering committee comprising um, uh, members from the organizations that sponsor, and in this case, Marcy Stores and Lucilek. And I want to thank Marcy Stores and Lucilek for being the first major sponsors of OBM. And uh, today they still remain the, the biggest sponsors. Um, without, without Massey Stores, there would be no OBM, I can tell you that. And Lucilek jumped on board and together they did it and, and they still continue to assist. But um, the other thing is we brought on board very early from, from the inception, once Massey Stores had agreed with, with our concept of the program, we agreed that we would bring on, well, I, the first person I contacted was Miss Anthony, Fortuna Anthony. Uh -huh. Of course, she's a well-known educator, former chief education officer, and she's a tireless worker. So she, we brought her on board and she helped with the further development of the program. Um, the SSDF has had, a, we've had about maybe three, we on to the third coordinator of OBM. And um, the OBM team is very powerful. We have a number of um, social officers that engage with the families directly because we recognize 
if, you, if I help a child, a family that has two or three children, and one, I help them to send one child to school, what happens to the others? So how does a mother feel knowing that she, what happens when they're at the same school, for example, mm. and one has access to resources and the other one doesn't? So, um, so we try to, 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 to factor in the entire family to see how we can provide assistance for them. And the other thing we do also, another thing we do is we look at housing in cases where the housing situation is really dire. We try to assist them there. But um, one of the first things we do too, we try to take a look at what's going on in terms of the income in the house. Um, is it if 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 the parents if the if the if the mother father whoever the breadwinner is if that person needs um training and capacity building we do that in some cases we've gotten them involved in our micro enterprise programs you know mm -hmm. in some cases we bought a weed eater or somebody wanted to make juice and things like that so we try to assist them mm -hmm. so so they can in turn um yeah, and you, you mentioned something that I actually want you to speak on. Um, like, your, your, what exactly is your micro enterprise pro, um, program? Uh, so, that has a little history. Mm -hmm. um, in earlier years at SSDF, we, we tackled the idea of a micro enterprise program. Everything has its time, and I suppose, um, you know, at the time the then board and, you know, um, wasn't, perhaps wasn't didn't think that it was uh, something that the SSDF should, should be doing. However, um, I tackle it again, and this time, because here's the deal. This this his, this is how our, our micro enterprise program works. We partner with Bell Fund on this, so we provide the funding. Bell Fund provides the training. We pay for a business officer. That officer works with the our BNTF our SSDF clients, sorry, uh -huh. right through until the loans are paid. They get um, the maximum. Um, that we would lend them through Bell Fund would be ten thousand dollars. At the time, it was no interest. We were reviewing the no interest component of it now, but mm -hmm. no interest. And um, also, we sought to differentiate a little bit from um, from Bell Fund in that we do our primary focus is not in collecting collecting rental payments. That is important to us. But what is more important to us is the survival of these businesses. And so we recognize that some businesses grow a little slower than others. And you know, once we can establish a person is serious and they try and we work with them, um, especially through the business officer who visits them monthly, you know, to assist them with, you know, um, with the accounting processes and marketing and different ideas. Um, we've been able to help a number of, in fact, going into COVID, I think we had about 50 something businesses going and um, COVID affected a number of them just like it did the wider industry but for those that were very serious we continued that was provided further funding and I mean in the initial stages it was very nice to see some some, some of the business people they really wanted to pay off these loans like right away and some of them did mm -hmm. and in fact we had to be trying to tell them they need to you know if we wanted them to we didn't want them to just put so much focus on paying off these loans and you know, so you run into cash flow problems and stuff like that. Oh. But the interest, a lot of them, they interest us in getting these loans paid. And they were very committed to that. Um, the rationale for that, because somebody may ask, well, you know, it's really an unsecured loan. You know, here it is, you're taking a chance on giving somebody $10,000 to do a business. They may not do anything. And you have no recourse. You can't go and take this and take that and the other. But um, for me, I, I looked at it like, like this. If we do not provide that assistance to them, that's people, that's clients that will continue to come to the SSDF every year for, for assistance. And if they have two or three children, that may very well add up very quickly to that $10,000. So you say, okay, you take a chance on them. And um, um, especially because one of, the, one of the difficulties for clients going to Bell Fund is that they have to get three guarantors. And that's always going to be a challenge for poor people, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, middle-income people may, may have challenges getting somebody to, to you know, to, to secure a loan for them. Um, so we knew it was always going to be challenging. Who want to take a chance and guarantee a loan for somebody, especially if they're unemployed? Mm -hmm. You know, so we took that chance on them. And I can tell you, it, it, is, it is successful. I mean, we were doing like about 60% at least of our businesses were doing okay. And mm -hmm. from, I'll say this here for me. 
if you get 50%, 60% of the businesses become successful, I think that is good. I think that is good because it is providing, a, they, one of the things with these small businesses is when they're successful, they go on to hire other people and they grow and what have you. So um, another strength of that program is it helps them to get accustomed to documenting and you know to making their deposits and what have you and so if they decide they want a loan for a higher amount they can go to bell fund directly or they could go to the commercial banks because now they have a record of payments and history of payments so it's a very very useful program i'm very good we continue to do it we continue to run that program and i mean i hope it is a program that um i think unless unless perhaps bell fund um adjust the requirement for the six guarant for the three guarantors or something then there will always be need for somebody to deal with to provide assistance for the very bottom in terms of indigence and poverty which will be the clients that we see now you have a lot of other very important programs obviously not just aimed at um, at young people and, and uh, facilitating to be facilitating people to be mm -hmm. self-employed, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, you have programs for parents called the National Parenting Program. Um, you also have a Senior Home Givers Program. I want you to yes, talk um, a little bit about those programs. Yes, um, in terms of National Parent, the, the whole thrust for parenting, again, that was, um, that's driven really a lot by, um, by Ms. Anthony. And again, that is one of the key pillars of, of support under the Our Boys Matter program because we recognize, again, one of the deficiencies, one of the challenges faced by a lot of poor families is that a lot of the, the parents, they, they lack the parenting skills necessary for them to, you know. Um, I'll give you an example. Even, even the, the understanding of the importance of getting involved, one of our challenges is getting the parents to be involved in the, with the children. Now, again, with persons of affluence, a lot of times you see them, you know, taking their children here, taking their children here, taking them to activities and, you know, and helping them at home with school work and all kinds of things like that. Um, you find in a single mother, for example, with how many children probably trying to, to do her, you know, work, she doesn't have a lot of time to, you know, to focus on, on, on the children and, you know, on parenting. But parenting is, is a critical role. And so, um, we, we, we try to equip them, we provide training, workshops, and um, it's very warmly embraced there by them, I must say that. Um, the persons that participate, they enjoy the training. Some of it is, um, is done by Ms. Anthony again. And, um, but there's a lot of enth enthusiasm for, for it in the workshops. And, and we think that goes a long way in helping, helping some of these the persons that we assist in terms of the challenges that they children of raising children, which is central to a lot of the issues that we have going on, the negative issues we have going on in our society, not just with boys, but with girls also. Yeah. And uh, the senior home caregivers the program, home tell care. us about that one. Um, the home caregivers program has a long history and it has gone from one administration to the next, it is called something else. Um, that program really started initially at the SSDF under the Stevenson King administration. Mm -hmm. We had home caregivers under the HOPE program. Now, back in the days, HOPE used to get a lot of money, you know. So one of the things that we did um, under the then ED, Mr. Joachim Henry was the ED at the time. And um, so we had, we had um, not as large as it is now, but we had a number of persons. And the idea was for them to go out and in some cases just to to talk and you know because there are a lot of there are a lot of older people that live alone and they don't see anybody for, for you know for a long period of time and sometimes all they want is for somebody to sit and talk to them and um, you know this thing is just it's a strange very it's a strange phenomenon in that um, even when I remember one time in the early stages when we ran out of funding the caregivers continued to go on visit their clients, you know, so they had established that relationship, that human relationship. Um, now the program is very big, um, probably have about, have about over 600 clients and over 400 workers in the field. It's a very big program as you can understand and um, 
and they provide you know, invaluable service to a number of persons in need. Um, the other thing the program did, and it does too, is um, provides sometimes things like pampers, cleaning supplies, you know, because sometimes some people, again, or the most of our persons we target are poor persons. So sometimes the conditions under which they live, you know, they don't have cleaning supplies, sometimes they don't have food, they don't have pampers and things like that. So um, the program seeks to provide that sort of um, assistance to them. And um, it is, like I say, it is a big, a very big program. Um, it was run, conducted under the NICE program after, um, it, after the initial days of it. And then, of course, now um, it, it is now what we call the home care program. But, you know, the whole concept has been the same. And it is something that, look, let's face it, I mean, at the end of the day, government will always have a responsibility to take care of older persons that cannot take care of themselves. Society, when I say government, I'm talking, the, by extension, people of St. Lucia, um, or any country for that matter. There are some people that cannot take care of themselves, and uh -huh. we have no choice but, but to take care of them. It's just the human thing to do. Uh -huh. And I, I think that is a responsibility. I'm happy to see that, um, that the governments of St. Lucia have, you know, um, recognized and, and, and put in the resources. You can well imagine it was a very costly program. Very, very costly. And so, um, you know, they, they even, the government has invested in it, continues to invest in it, I should say. Now you, I, obviously you would need um, a lot of training, I suppose, to deal yes. with, um, yes. with seniors in the home. Yes. I understand that you had training for the home caregivers um, I think that ended in, in, at, in the, yes. at the end of June this year. Yes, uh, could yes. you talk about that training yes, program? Yes, yes, yes. And it's critical because, um, um, let's put it this way, there are a number of factors here. So you have issues that you're going into a person's home, the private space, and you'd appreciate a lot of persons that, that would probably apply for these jobs do not have the necessary training. So training is ongoing, eh, by the way. So um, it is periodic. We, we keep on you know, training because we know persons, we want persons to be constantly reminded and ensure that they continue to do what they're supposed to do in terms of taking care of the clients. And um, so we continue to do that. Also, the, um, we take very seriously the business of training of the supervisors because the supervisors of these workers also need to be trained in order to effectively manage them in the field. You'd appreciate that. Um, um, unlike a business, normal business where you have a building and you or you know, and a floor space and you have persons being supervised by one, out there is very different. You hear it is you have maybe you have one supervisor in a country. We have about maybe probably about 25 supervisors altogether for 17 constituencies. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at it, look at the numbers 17 supervisors supervising over 400 people, it tells you that this, the, this, you know, the, the span of control is huge, mm -hmm. you know, so they need to be properly um, equipped, skilled, so that they can, they can um, supervise these persons. And then you're talking about, again, managing people, different personalities, different attitudes and what have you. So that is very challenging. So we also undertake the supervisory training. Um, that was also done recently. And with regard to the other training, specialized training, we have nurses that get involved in the actual training so that they t teach the clients, you know, our, our workers how to, how to deal with, you know, how to take care of the elderly. Okay. We're coming very close to the end of the program. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to, is there anything that we may have missed, anything else you want to address before we go off air? Um, resource mobilization is key and i will say this it gave birth to obm but it also gave birth to a critical link with the diaspora that has served us very well um, coming out of a resource mobilization effort when we started to target the private sector and realized that things were you know were not going as we as we would have liked um, we decided we you know i got some contacts with I knew, having lived in the U.S. for some time, that um, we have St. Lucian associations overseas. 
What I didn't know at the time was that there was an umbrella body mm -hmm. called the USLOE, Union of St. Lucians Living Overseas, and they operate in Canada, the US, and the UK. Um, as a matter of fact, every two, year, every, every two years they have their biannual convention, and, um, and what they do is they seek to, to they come together because the, the chapters in the various countries are set up to try to assist um, the solutions, for example, USLOE, oh. in, the, in, the, in, in the various countries, and also the St. Lucia by extension. Um, so once we got that link, and at the time um, it was Ross Cadas, Mr. Ross Cadas was the president of USLOE, um, also facilitated by the time by Minister Sarah Flood Bovere, we were invited, the SSDF was invited to address, to make a presentation to the USLOE um, in, in the UK in, is it 2019? Uh -huh. 28, 28, 2019. Anyway, so we went and made that presentation and let me tell you, they were really, they were fascinated. They, they indicated that they couldn't believe that there was an organization like the SSDF in St. Lucia and they had never heard anything about it. Um, they were particularly pleased because to them, here was an opportunity now for them to make meaningful contributions to St. Lucia because outside of you know somebody sending and asked for help they don't know what didn't know what it was going to whether it was legit but to have an organization that was you know a governmental organization that was not essentially part of a ministry you know so they were very happy coming out of that um they were very enthusiastic i made the presentation myself and they were very very pleased with it and um i mean even come on coming out they were ready to to to, to join us and act. Mm -hmm. Coming out of that um, was a decision to set up an MOU between the, the USLOA and, and the SSDF um, for us to s establish a, th a thrift shop, although we wouldn't call it a thrift shop, mm -hmm. um, to establish a, a thrift shop thrift in St. Lucia with the um, supplies being coming from, from the, the three three uh -oh. countries it, it sounds yeah. like um there's uh, a lot left to talk about yes um but we'll have to discuss it on another program okay. because we've come to the end of this one, one. Okay. i want to thank you very much for mm -hmm. coming on our program mm -hmm. i hope you will be back another time to speak more about the ssdf oh most definitely thank you you're watching issues and answers i'm your host jack kingston compton thank you for watching we'll be back next time mm -hmm.